And finally tonight, we bring you part two of Raphael Puberman's conversation with New York Times op-ed columnist Ross Douthit. Douthit stopped by our studio to discuss his new book, To Change the Church, a thought-provoking examination of Pope Francis and the current doctrinal direction of Catholicism. You know, no, what underlies the thinking um, of Pope Francis is his view that the church, in his words, uh, should be a field hospital for the wounded, yep. that the, the primary concern should be for the real suffering of real people, uh, that mercy should always trump the law, and that, in fact, that was the example set by Jesus in the Gospels, that he always confronted the Pharisees, saying, look, mercy, compassion, uh, trumps your insistence on the law, and that that's what he's doing. Yes, and the counter, the counter. I mean, first of all, I would say that the field hospital metaphor is a beautiful one, yeah. right? And I mean, and, and I should also say, you know, I could be wrong. Right? <laughs> I'm, I'm a lay Catholic journalist. There are critics of Francis who have better credentials than I do, but it's important any time you criticize the Pope mm -hmm. uh, as a Catholic to say, you know, you, you, I'm offer, you know, you're offering this in mm -hmm. a spirit of humility, and it could be that he's right and I'm mistaken. Uh, the counterpoint, though, to the general argument you just made is that Catholicism aims for synthesis. And so mercy and justice um, exist in a synthesis where mercy doesn't destroy justice, it fulfills it. And, I mean, there are sort of, you know, specific cases you could cite. You could say, you know, well, is it merciful if the Church abandons the, the idea of indissolubility? Is it merciful to the children of divorced people who want to believe that their parents' first marriage was real? Is it merciful to couples struggling for whom the Church is teaching is a reason to keep going and keep their marriage together? I mean, there are, there are costs. It's not only mm -hmm. the divorced couple themselves who experience the need for mercy and for a church that respects mm. their experience. And then the other point is just Jesus, you know, Jesus in the New Testament argues constantly about the ritual, the ritual law of Judaism, where he says, you know, that the Pharisees and other groups have taken this ritual law too far, piling burdens on people that mm. need to be lifted. But on the moral law, basically on everything having to do with sex and money, right, yeah. the two great vices yeah. of human yeah. beings, He's harsher. He elevates yeah. things. He raises standards. Um, and that's, you know, that's yeah. in the New Testament, too. And indeed, yeah. he often will, when he attacks legalists, yeah. he'll say, oh, you're using legalism as a way to evade your moral responsibility." And it's the Pharisees who believe in divorce. And right. And the, argue, no the argument divorce. with the Pharisees is they're saying, you know, that our laws allow for divorce. And he's saying, your yeah. laws are a legal construction yeah. that gets yeah. in the way of God's ultimate yeah. intention. You know, a lot of the conservatives are criticizing the Pope for, because he's clearly, as you document, firing, purging uh, conservatives from the right. hierarchy, uh, otherwise, uh, you know, exiling them from the hierarchy. And he's passing over important archbishops and, uh, when he's naming cardinals uh, because they're conservative and instead naming uh, lesser known archbishops as cardinal. But isn't that what his two predecessors did in reverse? Isn't that what John Paul did, what Benedict did? Didn't, didn't they pass over liberals and name conservatives? In, in certain ways. I mean, Fran Francis has been a little more sort of vigorous and overt about this in some cases. And some of this is because it's not a liberal conservative thing. It's that he wants to bring in more voices from the peripheries, right? Mm -hmm. So more cardinals and archbishops. So he's made more cardinals from small countries, small Catholic communities mm -hmm. around the world to try and bring the peripheries to the center. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's part of it. There's, but in general, and, and this is in part why, you know, in, in my own book, I didn't focus that much criticism on his style of yeah. governance. Um, you know, the Pope does seem to have a bit of an autocratic style in mm. sort of internal Vatican politics. Mm. Um, but that's actually not, you know, many popes yeah. <laughs> have had yeah. popes firing people, popes getting yeah. mad at their subordinates, popes giving tongue lashings to people. All of that's interesting. But it's not what's mm. really unique and interesting about this pontificate. Yes. It's the doctrinal civil war that's the sort of new and fascinating thing. And, and this doctrinal civil war that he's engaged in and that he kind of l is leading, how much has it detracted from the other reforms that he pledged to make in the church, like reform the finances of the Vatican, deal finally seriously with the sex scandals and, and the cover-up by the bishops, and lead with the corruption in the Vatican. How much has I mean, it detracted a lot of that, from it? A, a lot of that stuff just hasn't happened. Uh, the reality is that, and, and I don't know whether it hasn't happened because the Pope has been busy fighting these other battles, 
or whether it's just that the Pope, you know, the Pope has a very personalized style, right? Mm -hmm. So when the Pope wants to, you know, he'll go and give a public scolding to the Curia and the Vatican bureaucracy and list all of the sins that they're guilty of and so on. But when it comes to restructuring, you know, plans get made and then they get put off and then they get put off again. Um, and the same thing with sex abuse. The Pope has, he's gone further, I think, admirably than Benedict did in removing a few specific bishops who had... But who he's had, still defending some. But he still defends some when there's someone who he feels personally connected yeah. to. And again, there isn't yeah. a... F there's been a sort of delay in a formal structure being put in place. So he is, yeah. he's sort of... He has the voice of reform, mm -hmm. but not, I think, as much action as people hope for. We only have a couple minutes left. So let me ask you first. You know, I, my brother and I, as I told you earlier, were the first altar boys to do the Mass in English right. after Vatican Council II. So the changes after Vatican Council II were obvious and radical to all of us immediately. You say that the changes that the Pope is engaged in are even more radical than uh, Vatican Council II, but, but most they of the faithful are not seeing. Right. They don't have the same immediate effects for, for parish life and so on. No, there's no sort of civil war in the pews and so on. Mm. Um, the uh, Vatican II changed the everyday life of the church yeah. in a palpable way. What's happening here is a kind of high-level crisis that whose effects will be felt sort of slowly over years and decades, basically. Well, let me, let me ask you that. If the Pope continues in his radical ways, what is the future of Catholicism? If I'm wrong, right, in my criticisms, then it's new growth and evangelization, and people will look back on this and say, you know, the media was right to treat him as a sort of bold figure who found a way for Catholicism to live more successfully in modernity. That's the optimistic case. Hmm. The pessimistic case is that, you know, essentially the Pope is giving permission for different churches, dioceses, national churches, and so on, to experiment around all of these doctrinal and moral issues. And if that happens, and uh, over the same period there isn't renewal and growth, then what you're likely to have is essentially a sort of slow motion schism, where the German church, which is very liberal, becomes more and more Protestantized and very different from the African church or the Polish church, which is more conservative. And at a certain point, it becomes hard to see, as in other communions, the Anglicans most notably, how the center holds. Hold. Um, but honestly, I think this all ends with another Vatican II-style council, mm -hmm. which is something, there's, there's, it, there's irony in me saying this because it was something liberals would call for, but I think Conservatives have to acknowledge that, mm. in the end, all of the questions that the sexual revolution opened up aren't going to be sort of mm. settled by one pope okay. or another pope. We're going to end up all together in Rome arguing in 60 years or 100 <laughs> years or something. All right.